Uh, hi, this is Julia Latinina and this is Latinina TV, my YouTube channel. And I'm talking to Alexei Sobchenko, my friend, uh, and uh, he is a political analyst and former State Department employee. Uh, or rather, he is talking to me and I'm a Russian journalist, or rather a former Russian journalist, because I had to flee Russia. And the reason we're doing this video in English is that I'm covering a lot uh, the war in Ukraine. And uh, while I'm not a military expert, uh, I'm talking to a lot of military experts uh, from the Ukrainian side and independent ones. And I'm talking to a lot of Ukrainian soldiers and officers uh, at the front. And uh, I guess uh, I have something uh, to share with a Western audience. So usually I'm doing this in Russian and uh, my Russian audience knows me. Uh, but uh, today we'll try to do some of this uh, stuff in English uh, with the help of Alexei. So, Alexei, it's your turn to ask the questions. Yes, Julia. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, my first question is uh, the following. Looking at the situation from here, from Washington, D.C., we get, particularly after the fall of Lysychansk and Severinsk Donetsk, Severin Donetsk, we've got an impression that the situation is getting worse and worse for Ukraine. Recently, a uh, former Deputy National Advisor uh, Kitty McFarland said that Ukraine is losing this war slowly, bitterly, grudgingly. And yesterday, Thomas Friedman echoed this opinion by writing an article which says the Ukraine war is, is about to enter a dangerous new phase. So what is really going on over there in Ukraine? Well, it's complete bullshit because, yes, Ukraine war is about to enter a dangerous new phase, new phase uh, for Russian troops. Actually, it did enter, enter the phase with all these uh, ammunition depots being blown up for two weeks. There is over 30 ammunition depots, major depots, divisional level depots that are destroyed by uh, high mercies that have recently arrived in Ukraine. And this is a complete change of what's happening at the front because in order to understand what's happening, uh, we have to realize uh, that uh, Putin's strategy right now is to overwhelm Ukrainians with the mess, uh, with big amount of Russian troops, of uh, cannon meat, of, of cannon fodder, uh, and especially with artillery barrage. Uh, so, in order to have large quantities of ammunition being shelled, you have to have a large amount of ammunition stored. And this ammunition right now goes up in flames. And we see Russian offensive floundering, because after the fall of Lysychansk, Putin said that we're taking an operative pause. And this was a complete lie, because he immediately ordered Russian uh, troops to attack. He immediately ordered them to attack on the uh, on the whole front. Actually, it's it's so 1,400 kilometers of front, and almost at every place of significance, Russian troops started trying to attack or started trying to show that they are attacking. And when they attacked previously, it was first utterly barrage, an incredible amount of ammunition being used. And then the troops advanced. And now there was simply no barrage or very little for the lack of ammunition. And the offensive did flounder. And this is the major change that we see. Yes, it's a major change and it's absolutely incredible. Because if we compare this to performance of, uh, say, high mercies in Syria or in Iraq, we saw high mercies uh, performing in Iraq or in Syria. Uh, but uh, not to such an extent for an obvious reason uh, that in order for this uh, high mobility system to perform, you have to have good roads because the whole point is to shoot a missile and get away as soon as possible. You have to have the front line uh, because the vehicle is moving uh, somewhere in the rear. It uh, is obviously, it obviously has to be uh, safe from enemy's fire. And the most important thing, 
you have to have something really big to destroy. The ISIS fighters, they didn't have large armed depots. They did not uh, have utter, they didn't use artillery barrage to advance. Right now, uh, Putin is hoisted on his own pattern because the very strategy that Russia employs becomes its doom. And he just cannot do anything. In other words, you imply that four units, four HIMARS units, with the limited range of fire, happen to be a silver bullet which changed the course of war. Is it so? Uh, first of all, it's not exactly four bullet. Uh, f it's not exactly four HIMARSes. Uh, as far as I know, uh, it's uh, seven uh, or eight HIMARSes. So this is uh, was told to me by uh, the advisor to the office of President Zelensky, Alexei Aristovich. And uh, secondly, according to some experts, uh, namely to Alex Danov, to whom I talked, uh, this is a uh, former coroner, uh, at, uh, and uh, he was the guy who was serving in uh, Ukrainian uh, general staff. And he's a military expert right now. He says there are 17 units, not exactly of HIMARSes, but of HIMARSes and HIMARS-like vehicles. Uh, second, it's not so limited a range. Uh, first of all, it's 85 kilometers right now, even with conventional warhead. And uh, we see that there were several arms depots that were destroyed in Luhansk, uh, which is at least, which means it's at least 140 kilometer range. So obviously, Ukrainians uh, have some uh, more advanced missiles. But what is more important? is that it's, it's, it's not the number, it's still very limited. And that's the crucial question. If 17 units were able to wreak such havoc in the rear of Russian army and completely stop the Russian offensive, what is going to happen when 30 or 40 units will arrive? And actually, what does this speak what does this tell us about the Russian army, which claimed to be the second army in the world, if it can be stopped with, what, 17 units of uh, Western military equipment? Julia, uh, if the situation is the way you describe it, in other words, Putin is losing the war, what would be his response if the Heimerses and other uh, western provided weapons are going to uh, cause uh, inflict such a such a heavy damage that he would not be able to advance anymore his troops would not be able to advance anymore and probably not even be able to defend the positions which they managed to seize so far what do you expect is going to be his next step well that's a million dollar question because uh, we are recording this uh, on Wednesday, and on Friday, Putin is uh, calling uh, Russian. Well, I'm sorry to call this parliament. It's it's not exactly right to call this a Duma or a parliament. It's something else. But uh, well, he is calling whatever is called in Russian a parliament. And obviously, there are going to be some big advancements. And uh, theoretically, we can expect that this, this can coincide with the new offensive. And uh, there are signs of Russian pilots uh, flying Belarusian uh, military planes over Belarusia. And they are probably going to launch some pretty more or less precision rockets. The only precision rockets Russia has. It's H-31. And uh, there is a number of uh, Russian missiles called Iskander, which is a ballistic missile. Uh, they are right now sitting on Russian borders, and since Iskander is capable of uh, flying for 500 kilometers, and if they are at the Russian border, this obviously means they are going to fly somewhere very deep in Ukrainian territory. Uh, so we basically can expect uh, a total all-out offensive somewhere around this date uh, with the uh, 
missile with missile strikes with bombs uh, probably launched not from the Ukrainian territory itself because the planes uh, obviously probably won't cross the um, won't cross the border uh, not to be shot down because uh, Ukrainian air defense right now is quite strong but it will be a standoff engagement as I've said from the territory of Russia and from the territory of Belarus uh, and uh, we'll look what can happen but obviously uh, as Mr. Aristovich nicely put it uh, nothing worse can happen that what happened on the 24th of February because on the 24th of February uh, Putin had much more potent missiles much more precision uh, weapon, much more precision weapons, uh, more firepower, more, uh, well, troops. Uh, so basically, I suspect there will be a sort of, uh, you know, Putin will try to show that he is still the master. And I expect this to fail miserably as his present offensive is uh, failing. Uh, because, and I expect uh, some sorts of political announcements uh, like uh, maybe he'll declare war, maybe he'll declare mass mobilization, or maybe knowing Mr. Putin, this can be easily predicted, he'll be claiming that this is Ukraine which is attacking him. Because if you look at what was happening in the front for the uh, previous weeks, uh, you can see, for instance, a pattern. The Iskanders, which I already mentioned, they were stationed in uh, Belgrade, which is very close to uh, Ukrainian border. And they were shooting at targets, or rather at uh, peaceful people, targets. in Kharkiv. Targets, sorry, in Kharkiv. Uh, which didn't make any military sense because, you know, it was just he was using a million dollar missiles to strike at a house and to kill uh, children or women or whatever. He was doing just like what Hamas is doing to Israel also. Uh, but unfortunately, the Ukrainians, they don't have the Iron Dome system. Uh, so it was sort of uh, it was sort of Hamasization of Russian uh, military tactics. And the only reason, the only understandable reason he was doing this, uh, besides inflicting pure terror, uh, was, uh, you know, to, to, to uh, wait for the Ukrainian, for Ukrainians striking back. Because if you launch something that is capable of uh, flying 500 kilometers from a distance of 80 kilometers, this means you want Ukrainians to strike back, to be able to claim that they violated, violated Russian space, that they are waging war on Russia because their war is still undeclared. Ukrainians are not declaring it, so not to be the first side that declares the war. Russians are claiming that this is a special military operation and Putin and prison people who are saying that this is war, which is ridiculous. So obviously Putin needs some pretext to declare the war. And uh, my opinion is that he will claim that Ukrainians attacked him. Uh, quite prominent here, quite known here in the United States, professor of political science, John Mearsheimer, recently said that by providing weapons to Ukraine, we, the West, are prolonging this war because if we really are going to deal, uh, if, we're going to de if the Ukrainians are going to defeat Putin, he's going to use nuclear weapons as a response. What do you think of this logic? Oh, well, right. two questions. Uh, prolonging the war by giving weapons to Ukraine. This is right. a very sound logic. I would say that uh, if uh, United States and France uh, and uh, Great Britain did not engage uh, into war in behalf of Poland, there would have been no Second World War. There would be just Hitler's triumph. Uh, so I suggest this guy applies the same logic to the Second World War. Uh, and, uh, well, obviously it's a wrong kind of logic, I think. Uh, as to nuclear weapons, uh, yes, I think it's highly possible that Putin will use it. Uh, because this is the man who is living in his own world. 
and probably he is uh, partly thinking he can win. Uh, actually, his major, uh, major hope to win is not going Ukrainians, it's going the West into exactly this kind of thinking. Don't supply weapons to Ukrainians, don't prolong the war, just make them capitulate. And yes, I think, unfortunately, it's a possibility he'll be using nuclear weapons. But after all, if he's going to use nuclear weapons on Ukraine, we have to understand two things. First, he already used nuclear weapons on Ukraine. What happened to the city of Mariupol is much worse than what happened to the city of Hiroshima. Uh, Hiroshima, sorry. Uh, and if Ukrainians are willing to pay the price and they are not deterred, why should the West be deterred? You know, and my if Putin point. is somebody who can use nuclear weapons right now, then he's definitely somebody who will be able to use nuclear weapons in the future. Is he going to blackmail for the West for years and years on end? This is something that should be stopped. And if the West knows right now that this can be stopped with the help of Ukrainians and on Ukrainian territory, why should the West, you know, not help Ukrainians? Because obviously if Ukraine is going to fall, which is not going to happen, but if it's going to fall, then the West will have to deal with Mr. Putin on the territory of the countries that are NATO countries. And this is obviously will be much harder and there will be much bigger price to pay. The tactics of appeasement never work. They don't work in uh, the case of Hitler. They don't work in the case of Putin. May I ask one more question or that would be enough? Uh, I think there is one very important thing we did not cover because you started with asking about Lysychansk. And mm -hmm. yes, that sounds great, you know. I don't think that uh, the people who are listening to us ever knew where Lysychansk is or Severodonetsk is. And of course, this is a major success of Russian army. Taking a city you've never heard about and not everybody in Ukraine ever heard about this city. Uh, but in order to, you know, to have a pretty good estimate of uh, the scope of Putin's victory, I should remind our listeners the following. This is the third time Putin flounders, Putin's, Putin's strategy does not work in Ukraine. Putin's strategy fails in Ukraine. Because he's fighting the war number three, I would say. Because back on the 24th of February, he wanted to take Kyiv and Kharkiv and he promised to take it all in three days. Now this strategy failed. Now, after this, there was the second plan. And the second plan was creating a corridor and cutting off Ukraine from the sea, making it a landlocked country. This strategy also failed. He did not succeed in this military plan. He did not have enough, enough force. Uh, then his third strategy was taking Donbass. This is the territory, half of which he already possesses after 2014. And in order to understand what's happening with these uh, cities, uh, uh, the, the people who are, call, who are listening to us probably never heard about until now. Uh, one should understand that Donbass is a very arid region. It has practically no water. And back in 19th century, it was a steppe. It was inhabited by uh, very few people. There were small Cossack uh, villages uh, situated uh, in the nooks of crannies and rivers and whatever small, riv or small rivers. And when the major, uh, the industrialization of Donbass was started under Stalin on major scale, and a major water system was created that takes water from the river called Seversky Donetsk, 
and then later distributes uh, this water first to Donetsk, which is the capital of Donbass, and later on to Mariupol, which I already mentioned, which was the uh, target of a uh, Russian offensive and which is now destroyed and which was an Ukrainian city. Uh, this was a unique system. It had little less than 200 kilometers of water pipes, water bridges. These pipes were going over other rivers, over, you know, they were, it's, it was incredible. It has four, it had four pump stations. And it was situated. It's 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 major. Uh, it's it's it, the construction was situated mostly in the region of uh, Slavyansk and Kramatorsk. If somebody does know the history of uh, the war that started back in uh, 2014, these were the first towns uh, taken by Russians, taken by Mr. Gherkin, uh, in his bid to overtake Donbas because he knew where to strike, because he realized that, well, in order to survive, Donbass needs water. Without it, it will go back to the state of the desert. So why I'm describing this in such a detail? Because the real target of Russian offensive in Donbass is Slavyansk and Kramatorsk. This is the control over water system. And we need to understand two things. First, the water system is already destroyed. There's no water in Donetsk, there's no water in Mariupol, and there won't be. Because, you know, Russian system under Putin is built in, under, in such a way that I'm sure they will simply not will be able to reconstruct the system. It's completely destroyed by shedding. Uh, it, they will not be able to reconstruct the system because of the sheer level of incompetence and corruption. And the second point is that the offensive in Donbass is, go, is going for three months. And Russian army did not succeed in the task of taking over Slavyansk and Kramatorsk. The whole idea of taking Severodonetsk and Lysychansk was just a preliminary, one of the minor steps in taking the water system over. And the only thing Russians succeeded up until now to, uh, they succeeded in taking these two cities. They spent three months in doing this. And these were absolutely crucial uh, months for Ukrainians because by making Russian army, uh, because while Russian army was spending time and effort in taking Slav in, in taking Lysychansk and Severodonetsk, several things happened. First, Russian offensive on all other fronts stopped because there was not enough weapons and not enough troops. So all the troops were concentrated in this area. Second. The Ukrainians started shelling with new Western artillery, with new Western guns, uh, ammunition depots uh, in the rear. It was not even HIMARSes, it was the M777, but it was highly successful. Uh, and this is the major thing that happened. They stood their ground until the arrival of real Western help. This was the major thing they did, and did very courageously. So, if we compare this to a chess uh, game, uh, yes, the Ukrainians, they lost some territory. Like you will lose a knight or a pawn in a chess game. But they gained in strategy, and they gained in time, and they did an incredible thing. Because, as I've stood, as I've said, Russian offensive, has not reached its target in Donbass yet, and probably will not ever reach the target. And by sacrificing these two cities, the Ukrainians gained strategic momentum and they gained time. And this is very important. This is what happened in Lysychansk. Amazing. Well, this was 
very extremely interesting because even I never heard of this water system. There is a saying which was coined by one military historian that it is not the weapons which what wins the war, it's people who use these weapons. And even there were cases when Zulus, uh, who had just uh, spears and, 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 and wooden shields, managed... As you guys, exactly. I just didn't want to use this complicated word. They were able to annihilate uh, British forces, which were much better uh, equipped and uh, prepared for this kind of war and prepared for this kind of warfare. So, in other words, um, don't we pay too much attention to Heimers in other fancy system and do not take into account the human factor? Uh, okay, speaking of Zulus and the Asigais, this happened at the Battle of Is Ishandulwana, if I'm pronouncing this correctly in English. And unfortunately, it's uh, Russians uh, whom I would compare to Zulus, because that's exactly Putin's tactic. Uh, what happened at Ishandulwana, the British were shooting at Zulus until they ran out of ammunition, but there were just too many Zulus. Uh, so that's exactly how Putin is employing Russian troops. He's using them as cannon fodder, exactly as Stalin used them in uh, 1941 or 1943. And this is Stalin's tactics all over. And uh, I would like you to point out that this is probably one of the major problems with Putin's uh, strategy. That he does not have the resources Stalin had. Uh, he destroys cities during his offensive, like Stalin destroyed cities. But Stalin built them back with the help of the villagers that were around cities. Now Putin has no villagers to build back the cities. Stalin used Russian troops, Soviet troops, as cannon fodder, and there's a famous story about General Eisenhower asking General Zhukov, Marshal, Marshal uh, Zhukov, Marshal Zhukov, how do you go through a minefield? And Zhukov replied that we go through a minefield as if there were no minefield, meaning you just demine it with the bodies of soldiers. And that's exactly what Putin is doing. And the most funny thing is perhaps to point out that it's not exactly even Russian soldiers, his Russian regular soldiers, he is using for such operations. Uh, he's actually using recruits uh, from Luhansk and Donetsk, from the republics he claimed, so called republics, he claimed to liberate. So now we see that his liberation consisted in the fact that uh, the Mandia are literally conscripted like in some 16th century Germany. They are taken off the streets while they, are waiting, while they are waiting for water. And they are thrown on the front and they are being killed there in enormous numbers. Big numbers. And yes, and uh, well, Donetsk is practically devoid of population, especially of male population right now and actually the reason this sort of conscription happens is probably because uh, of corruption uh, because uh, you know it seems that Donetsk authorities were reporting to Putin that they have a large numbers of volunteers and uh, back for many years and they instead stole all the money uh, that was uh, that was handed out by Russia because it was handed out in cash to, uh, to build these troops. And uh, this is also the reason why, the, why these troops are armed with literally with Mosin rifles. The Many rifles 19, that they uh, used in. Late 19th century Russian uh, infantry Absolutely, rifles. Absolutely, yes. The rifles that were used, you know, before the Second World War. It's incredible. But that's true. And that's probably because the more, uh, the more modern armaments, they were simply stolen and sold. So the people who did this, they reported to Putin that everything is okay. And now they are literally taking people off the streets and using them as a cannon fodder. 
Uh, so speaking of Zulus, it's Russians or actually, um, to be more precise, the Donetsk citizens uh, that are carrying uh, that, 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 are, that are playing the role of Zulus. Uh, but speaking of courage, that is more important uh, than weapons. I would like uh, to recall the words, the famous words of Mario Puzo, who said that uh, with a gun and with a good will, uh, you can get much good more word. than simply with a good will. So with high mercies and courage, uh, you can get much more than simply with courage. The Ukrainian troops, the Ukrainian troops, they fought with incredible courage all these months before Western weapons arrived. And this is exactly what I was speaking uh, happened in Lesichansk. When they stopped Russian troops, uh, at, uh, what happened at Severodonetsk, when Russian troops were stopped precisely with courage. I do remember I was speaking to people who were fighting at Severodonetsk before Western weapons arrived. And these people were literally crying. They said, we are totally depleted. We have nothing. Actually, this was not even at Severodonetsk. This was before at Popasnaya, where there was a major Russian breakthrough. So these people who were right at the edge of this Russian uh, offensive, they were saying, we have literally nothing to fight with. Our resources are completely depleted. Our guns, old Soviet guns, are not precise. We are losing the fight. Our in-laws are exhausted. Uh, I was speaking to a gun, uh, to, to, to a man who uh, was, um, who get a concussion, who got a concussion, who landed in the hospital and who was literally cry crying over what's happening to his troops. And then I called him in a couple of days after the new Western guns arrived and it was not even high mercies, it was just M777. And you know, he was as a child who is given a new bright shiny toy. Uh, he was still in the hospital with concussion and the people from whom he was hearing about these new guns, they were also people who came into the hospital, also people who were wounded, but they were absolutely ecstatic. This changed everything. He was, you know, he was saying absolutely incredible things. Now we can fight. And yes, then the fighting started. Well, very interesting. Okay, so this was Yulia Latinina, this was Alexei Sobchenko. I don't know how much time was spent talking, but I hope it was not too much. Because actually there was one thing I did not talk about, and I think we can do it in the next installment if this one goes good. That's my favorite theme of net-centric war, is that Russian okay. army is fighting, uh, it has a rigid command structure, and it's fighting a Soviet-style battle. Ukrainian army is incredibly flexible, and every guy, not every soldier, but every officer in Ukrainian army knows what to do. Uh, but this we'll talk about probably a little bit later on. So this was Yulia Latina, this was Alexei Sobchenko. Thank you very much for listening to us. Bye. Thank you. Hmm.